began the teaching this past Sunday on the Holy Spirit and our identity. In a sense, we said that indeed we need to have an understanding of our identity so that we can live up to that identity. And the only way you will know your identity is from the one who made you. And the one who made you is God. And therefore, what he tells us from his word is the truth about us. So if I want to know the truth about me, I don't go to a shrink necessarily. I go to my Holy Spirit to tell me who I am. Because thank God for shrinks, thank God for psychiatrists and what they do, but they are limited to the extent which they're able to bring total and complete understanding of who you are to you. Because when they talk to you, unless he or she is a Christian psychiatrist, they will begin with the soul and end with the body without ever going into the spirit, which is the real you. And they are not trained in medical school to know what the spirit is. If they had any information at all, it would be from the church if they are born again. So if you really want to know who you are, you have to go to the Lord God to tell you who you are. And it just so happened that last Sunday, we heard the song, The Soloing by Dorcas, and, and it has, uh, again today, it has to continue in this teaching, reminded us about the importance of knowing who we are. So I'm sharing with you, and I shared last week about who you are on the basis of your new creation, that you're born again spirit. And today, uh, and, and uh, what I was told was that it was a good word. And so uh, you want to get a CD if you are here. Even if you were, uh, get a CD and listen to it because uh, you might have missed something. All of us do when we are hearing the message. But when we get it here over and over again, it ministers to us. Now, we said that we can say, or I can say, that I am that I am because of what the I am that I am says that I am. And so I am what the I am that I am says that I am. And God is the one who said that indeed, when Moses asked him the question, what is your name? He said, just tell Pharaoh, tell those who want to know my name that I am that I am. So what I'm saying to you now is, is that I'm going to tell you what the I am that I am says that you are. And I'm going to tell that to you from his word, which is the truth. And then you should be persuaded by what you hear, even though it may not seem like you are what the word says you are. Keep on saying it. Because saying it and singing it, as we did here, is what will bring it to pass. Praise the Lord. So we began by talking about a, I am a new creation. And today... I want to talk about the topic under this theme, Holy Spirit and my identity, Holy Spirit and your identity. I want to take as a sub-theme or subtitle to this message, I am a child of God. And I like to preface the new creation and a child of God with the I am. Because when you say, I am, 
you are declaring a, an existence that is continuous, that is ongoing. You know, this is the reason why I believe that God told Moses to tell Pharaoh that I am that I am, that he is always in the now. And so what you say that you are as I am is who you say that you are at this moment, at this time. And if you keep saying that I am, I am, I am, every moment you will be that I am. That's how eternity works in that regard. So let us talk about what it means to be or to say that I am a child of God. When you say that you are a child of God, you are saying also that you are an heir of God. All children are heirs. They may not know it, but they are. All children are heirs. Or they are parents. Are you listening to me here? And so being a child of God makes you an heir of God. And the scripture tells us that. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> and let's look at verse 16. We're going to read verses 16 through 17. It says, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit. This is why the title of this series is The Holy Spirit and My Identity. Because it is the Holy Spirit that bears witness with my spirit. He confirms and affirms in me that I am a child of God. That's what the scripture says. Do you see that? It says the spirit himself bears witness with my spirit that I am the child of God. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So it is important to remember that indeed it is the Holy Spirit who is working in us and making us aware, confirming in us that we are the children of God. The interesting thing about this, which makes this different from the old covenant, only the old covenant, the children of the covenant, like we are the children of the new covenant, the children of the old covenant were referred to as the children of Israel. Because they could not actually see themselves as the children of God. And they couldn't be the children of God then because Jesus hadn't come. And because the Holy Spirit couldn't bear witness with them in the way. I listen to you. Because the Spirit in them was not the Spirit of God. Are you getting me here? But when the Spirit of God comes on the inside of you, now the Holy Spirit can bear witness with that Spirit. After all, that Spirit came from Him that indeed you are a child of God. Praise the Lord. And as a child of God, you are an heir. And I often say here, an heir is someone that something good is coming to. Hello? You know, and this is why all of us are looking at you know, leaving something behind for our children when the day comes that we go to heaven. I do believe that uh, all of us are going to be raptured out of here anyway. I mentioned to you that beginning next year I will be ministering on, on that because I really think that we need to know the signs of the times. And uh, every so often I'm led by God to actually share that with you so you will not be ignorant of it. Uh, even some of you already know that we will we'll bear repeating that. But anyway, so the point here is that the, the, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit, man, that indeed we are the children of God. I spent a great deal of time last week talking about the spirit, man, the new creation, and, and that's what I'm talking about, that the new creation knows by the Holy Spirit witnessing to him, in him, that indeed he is a child of God. And as a child of God, let's go to the next verse, verse 17. And it's children, then heirs. You see that? When you are a child, you are an heir. That means when you are a child, there's something that you inherit. If truth be told, all of us inherit something from our parents. Is, is that true? All of us inherit something from our parents. If not at all, the DNA. At all. If they don't give us anything at all, they give us DNA. 
at all. But thank God to give us more than that. But so, so if children, then heirs, heirs of God, what, what does that mean to be an heir of God? I was meditating on this. It got me so excited. And sometimes when I get excited and I come and tell you, uh, I know sense that you are as excited as I am, but I'll try again this morning. <laughs> and Pastor Cla uh, Donna also says this, that when you, they don't respond like you want them to respond, know that they got it. Sometimes they are reflecting on what you said, meditating on what they said. So don't think that, that the responses indicate that they did not really get it. And so I'm going to, by faith, believe that what I'm about to say to you, you got it anyway. Praise God. But you will love this. You will love this. And that's what you have to do. When you, it's not only enough to read the Bible, to study the Bible, to speak the words of the Bible, it's also important to meditate in it. And when you meditate in it, it means that you take a scripture and you just spend time on that particular one, go over it, chew on it, over and over, regurgitate it, you know, back and forth. And before you know it, God is opening more information, knowledge, understanding of that particular word or scripture to you. So, you know, and when I looked at it, uh, read the air of God, I was trusting the Lord in meditation to, to, um, to actually get something more than what I read in the scriptures. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. So this is what I got. To be an heir of God is to inherit God right? Your inheritance is not money, land, uh, precious jewels. All of those things can come with that. But the real inheritance, what you really inherit is God. Imagine sitting down with the attorney after your dear loved one go home with the Lord and the attorney is sitting down to tell you what's in the will. Right? And so you sitting down, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is our advocate, Jesus is our advocate, and we're sitting in front of God the Father and they are telling us what's in the will. And what they say in the will is, that's all they have it on, the, on paper, G-O-D. That's all it's in the will. You inherit G-O-D. I'm done, you got it. Oh my God. Imagine, that's what you inherit. That's what you inherit. You inherit the mind that created heaven and earth. You inherit the mind that created you. You inherit the very persona, the very profile, the very personality, the very person who put all of this together. That's what you inherit. Not only that, you also inherit eternity. Because God never intended for man to ever cease living. And so really man never actually ceases his existence. It's a matter of where he will live when he lives here. But eternity, to, a, to inherit eternal life, is to inherit the Zoe life, the life of God itself. And that's what you also inherit. And so I said, Lord, explain it more to me. 
and said, go to this scripture you're about to read. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I've said, if you heard me preach here often, you heard me say this before. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That the Lord wants you to know the love that Jesus has for you and I. It passes knowledge. What means that you can never actually study it and learn it to find out what it is. You never will know it. It will actually take you to be in a place where you get it by revelation. So, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So when you inherit God, you inherit eternal life and you inherit the fullness of God. So when you say that I am a child of God, you are saying in a sense that I am filled with the fullness of God. Amen. Yes, are you getting me yet? Amen. And I know you say that it's difficult for people to accept it, even perhaps yourself. Because you are looking at yourself as how you see yourself, rather than looking at yourself the way God sees you. Amen. If you look at yourself the way God sees you, then you can accept that God sees you to be his heir and that he intends for you to live up a life filled with all his fullness. Imagine having to inherit, you know, have you seen this bumper sticker? It says, uh, I am spending my grandchildren's Inheritance. Have you yeah, anybody seen that? Okay. Now, God says, uh, "Listen, that as far as that inheritance, it can never be wiped out, spent completely, totally to finish that inheritance. It, it is. It is limitless." And so even when it is spent, there's more replenishing of that which is spent. Imagine having access to a replenishing inheritance that no matter how much you spend, there's more coming. In fact, and this is the thing that got me. Oh, this is what got me. In fact, God wants you to need him because the need that you have for him expands your capacity to be filled. God is saying that when you need him, that is when he supplies you that need. And so the more you need, the more you will get. And he wants you to want more and more and more so that he can fill you more and more. And so if you get a billion dollars, he says, ask for more. Ten billion dollars, ask for more. Hundred billion dollars, ask for more. Because the more you ask, the more you are supplying. That's your inheritance that you have access to limitless wealth, limitless, limitless riches, lim limitless, it's limitless. Oh my God. Now, so you think about it. Since it is the case that you are heir of God, heir of unlimited supply of what and who God is to you, that's a fill with all his fullness. Since that is the case, can you live it out? Can you live it a life out where you are expanding your capacity every day that you wake up? Every day you wake up, 
you are expanding your capacity. So how do you expand your capacity? When you make confession of the word, when you declare what the word of God says, you are expanding your capacity. You say, for example, that I am the redeemed of the Lord, and I say so. You wake up in the morning, you say that, you expand your capacity for redemption. It may be in one area that you, you sense your challenge in that area. If it's like me, maybe butter pecan ice cream. Hello. You want, to, you want to moderate it. Not to completely give it up. But, you know, instead of taking a whole bowl, maybe a cup. But the point is, the more you declare that I am the redeemed of the Lord and I say so, the more you say that, the more you expand your capacity. A child of God has been created by God with the desire for expansion. What do you think? The Bible, the Bible says to us that God said, let there be light, and there was what? Light. And it is said light is still expanding today. The universe is limitless. I listen here. The capacity of this universe, more stars are being born, more galaxies, more planets. I mean, it's just, and the scientists can't even put their hands on it anymore. They just, because the more they thought that they had found the end to this galaxy, the more then they get more powerful telescopes and they find there's more beyond the law. And I'm saying that God has created you with the capacity for more and more and more and more. He is the God of all increase. Praise the Lord. That's who you are as an heir of God. Imagine having the attitude that, that indeed that you live a life where you are always receiving the supply from your father. Oh, he wants you to do that. Father, I need money to pay this lie bill. He wants, you to, he wants you to tell him that. Ask him that. Say, whoever asks, receives. You knock, is open. You seek, and you find. Isn't what he says? Who said it? Jesus said it. Just ask. Whatever that you're dealing with that is a challenge, you ask. I am an heir of God. You know, um, Pastor Donald came to Pastor Hawkins' church last week, and some of us were there. And his, uh, Pastor Hawkins' grandson just walked into the office while Pastor Hawkins and Pastor Donald were having their little tete a tete before he came to the pulpit to preach. And the boy just walked in there like he owned the place. <laughs> he didn't care about who. Pastor Dollar was, he knew his grandpa was in an office there. He just walked in there and he was wondering, who are you talking to my grandfather? <laughs> it got to the point where Pastor Dollar's message on Wednesday night, his Bible study, he brought it up on national TV, talking about it. That that's how it is that you know that you have a father that you can go to him any time. Are you getting me here? Access to the Father. You are heir of God. You open up. There are some people that will not be able to have the freedom to enter into the Father's house, but you have access to the. That's why the, 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 the Jewish people were so, you know, incensed with Jesus. He was always talking about God as a Father. They always talk about the Father as Abraham. And he was talking about God as a father. Philip went to, went to him and said, he said, he said, he said, Master, show us the father. You talk about the father, father all the time, show us who it is. And he said, he said to Philip, have I been with you all this time? And you have not known the father. If you see me, you have seen the father. Oh, praise the Lord. You are an heir of God. You represent the Father in the earth. 
And the Father wants you to go to him to ask him for everything. That's how you expand your capacity. When the capacity is expanded, the capacity is always filled. Because nature abhors vacuum. Capacity is vacuum that needs to be filled. The Bible says, he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be what? Filled. When there's hunger, then there's a vacuum of food in your belly. Is that true? And so then there's a desire to eat. And so when you have to create the desire to be filled. Oh, I hope you get this. You have to create the desire to be filled. And so whatever you need, create a desire of that need. The need is there so the desire will come for that particular need to be met. So it's okay to have the need. It's okay to go to the Father and express to him that, Father, this is the need that I have. And I don't have anybody to go to to talk to about this need but you. Jesus said that I can come to you because the door is wide open for me to enter into the throne of grace to ask for help at the time of my need. Oh, praise the Lord. Because when you are an heir of God, you have not only God's DNA, not only does he want you to be filled by him, it means also that now you can uh, create a capacity for him, God, to fill you up with what is it that you need. What do you need this morning? What do you need? I know if truth be told, all of us will say, money, 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 money. Money. So how do you get the Father to fill the need of money that you have? This is where the teaching, this nine o'clock teaching I had in Bible study is so important. I said that after you have learned that it's the Father's desire, according to his word, to do something for you. And the logos is clear on that. The next thing that you must want is you, want, you must want the rhema for the logos. You must want to hear his voice, his wisdom on that particular thing that he says is available to you. Did you get me? It, the very, there's a very thing that is available to you that you need to hear his voice concerning that. Now, there's an interesting story in the Bible about a famine that took place in the land of Israel. It was because they were under siege. And so they couldn't go out of the, out of the gates because if they did, the enemies that had surrounded them would move in there and conquer them and defeat them and all that. And so they locked the gates, closed the gates, and they stayed behind uh, the, the wall city. But in so doing, after a while, they ate almost everything they had. And one day it came to the point where they sent for Prophet Elisha and to the king, and he went to the king, and of course, most of the times, they blamed the prophets for whatever it is that was going on. Now, they blamed the messenger for the message that is given. Uh, any, any message that you hear that is difficult for you to hear, it means that in that message somewhere you're offended by it. That's why you are hard-headed. Uh, you have a tough time responding to that particular message. So most times the, 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 the kings of Israel had the difficulty with that. So in this instance, what was going on was that Elisha said that the price of flour, and in today's terms, would be like pennies the next day. So you watch. I'm telling you from the Lord, the answer to the capacity that we, you have in Israel, the need for food in Israel, said so next day you will sell rice, or corn, whatever it is, that you, for pennies, will be for nothing. So, oh, one of the king's advisors said, how could you possibly say that? If the windows of heaven were open and rainfall and all that, could there be enough crops or harvest to be able to do that for the next day? And he said, your eyes will see it, but you will not eat from it. 
He got a word, a rhythm of word. Another example, quickly, and I'll get back to that story. Remember uh, this man that was praying? He had, uh, he was a king, uh, Hezekiah, and the Lord uh, Isaiah, sent Isaiah to go tell him to, uh, uh, you know, prepare himself and, and get ready because he was going to die. You remember that? And, and then he, was say, he said to him, uh, the Bible says he turned his face against the wall. He got the word, he turned his face against the wall and prayed and asked God to, to extend his life. And it happened that before Isaiah would leave the palace, God spoke to Isaiah to go back and tell Zechariah that 50 more years have been added to his life. I'm talking about hearing from God. Because now that he is in you, now that he says you can come to you, now that you can talk to him, you can go to him and ask him the, the, the answers, the wisdom for the questions that you have. Well, the story goes that, that the next day, that night, in the very tents of where the soldiers have come to, to attack Israel, in those tents, there were four lepers that were around there that um, decided that they were going to go, because you know, usually lepers were quarantined, they were kept away from the city so they don't uh, infest the, 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 the citizenry, the people of that city. So they were quarantined and they would bring food to them. But you know, remember that because of the, of the siege, there was nobody leaving the city to take any food to them. There was no food anyway to be taken to them. So they were getting hungry and they said to themselves, well, you know what, if we stay here, we will die. If we go over there and go to the city, they might stone us to death because that's what they're supposed to do because you know, we, uh, they have lepr and all, uh, leprosy. So anyway, they decided to go anyway. And in walking towards the city, God made the soldiers in the tent hear the, the noise, the clamor, the sound of chariots of horses that were running towards them. Now you think about it. Here are lepers. When lepers walk, because of the the sores that they have under their feet, there's no way that they can walk briskly, much less walk to the, to the sun of chariots that are rushing towards the tents of the soldiers. But God took the natural first step of lepers walking and used that natural and put a super on it and became a supernatural, miraculous thing. The God of power, the God of miracles, did that miracle, and the soldiers in the tent took off and ran for their lives. When the lepers got into the tent, there was all kind of spread. Turkey, pork chops, steaks, you know, all kinds of food set up there, and they sat down there and they ate to their fill. And there were precious uh, garments and gold and all that. They collected some and hid some, and then they said to themselves, you know what? It's not good for us to know this and not go tell the people in the city. This is what giving does. Had the people in the city not given to the lepers, that's why Word of Life, we have FBI and CIA ministry. Because we don't know which ones of those that come to the Tuesday, Thursday, will one day step up and build this church. Amen. Hello. Amen. One day be the very answer. Because the people who were taking food to the lepers, the lepers were the ones who brought the news, the report that the soldiers had fled there was so much out there in the tent, and the king sent his soldiers and went in. And indeed, they were able to sell <laughs> wheat, flour, name it, for a penny. And the man that was the assistant to the king saw it, but there was such a rush to open to get in that they trampled under him and he died. They trampled over him and he died. 
Elisha said, you will see it, but you will not eat, uh, take of it. What is the point? When you have a, you are a child of God, you are an heir, now you have access to the one who says you can inherit him, and his name is God. Now, God wants you to have an opportunity to fellowship with him, to communicate with him, so that he can tell you things that you need to know about yourself, about your marriages, about your children, about your business, about your careers, about everything that you need to know. Because the more you create the capacity for him, the more he will feel it. Oh, praise the Lord. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Remember the story about the prodigal son? The prodigal son went to his father and asked for his inheritance. He got the inheritance, went and blew it. We know the story. But he went back. Oh, glory. He went back. That was capacity. He went back. He wanted to be a servant, but he went back. He went back because as a servant, there was a, another level of capacity that would be created. Not a capacity for a son, but a servant doesn't get what a son gets. So he was even prepared because here he had nothing. He's not going to get a little bit as a servant. But when he got there, he found that the once a son, always a son. And he came to have more than enough. Praise the Lord. Are you listening to me here? The key here is to remember that indeed you serve a father, a God, that wants you to have fellowship with him, to talk to him about what you want, what you need. Ask him. Ask. Ask if there is a way to really get through. Ask him things that are hidden from you, that, that, that unless he tells you, you will never know. Ask. Talk to him. Your identity is an heir of God, meaning that you have rights to him, you have access to him. Now, not because of you qualifying for it, not because you deserve it, but because he wants you to have it. Do you know one of the greatest difficulties that, in fact, let me put it this way, one of the things that God dislikes the most perhaps above everything else, is the fact that people don't receive what it gives them. The greatest pain, if there's a pain at all that God has, is the pain that people don't receive what he gives them. He is giving you the right to be an heir. The question is, will you receive your inheritance? Did you get it here? And there are Christians who think that they will receive their inheritance when they get to heaven. When they die and go to heaven, that's when their inheritance begins. But for us here at Word of Life, we know that even here, even whilst we are here, he expects us. And I will show you in the scripture why it is that he wants us to receive this inheritance. Because he wants to show us off. God wants, there's never a better or greater testimony than a testimony that one gives that I was once under the power of darkness. Now I have been set free and I'm living under the power of light. What a miracle. What a transformation. That brings glory to God. People will know you, who your God is, who your Father is. And the Bible says, let your light so shine before men so they will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, Matthew 6, uh, 15, somewhere like that. But uh, 5, 16 rather. 5, 5. But the whole thing is, is that it's important for you to recognize this point. That God wants you to inherit, your, possess your inheritance. 
So uh, let me go on and, 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 and uh, give you two scriptures that will help prepare you for that. Go to Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Now, so we're going to find out how God wants us to inherit. You are a child of God, and as a child of God, you are an heir, and as an heir, you are to inherit. It says, for the promise, read that with me, read, read, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, the reason why it was not through the law, because if it was through the law, then you would have to qualify for it. You have to do something to deserve it. If it was through the law. But if it was through the righteousness of faith, then it is you just receiving as a gift. Are you here? You know, if it is through the law, then you will have to get it by your performance, by you qualifying for it, by you deserving it, by you earning it, by you meriting it. But if it's through the righteousness of faith, then it's a gift. Amen. And all you have to do is to receive. This is why it hurts God that people don't receive from him. Amen. That's what I was saying to you earlier. Because if everything to him is a gift that he wants you to receive, he wants you to have, and the way we receive a gift spiritually is to believe it. Because, because if I were to give a, my, the pair of glasses here to uh, Minister Kweku here, he will receive them for me. But the point is, is that in the spiritual realm, he has to believe me for them. I listen to you here. And so you will say, I believe I have the glasses. Whereas in the natural, you receive it physically from me. You get me here? And so that's why we tap into our gift by believing it. That's why I'm spending time telling you who you are so you can believe it. Because as you believe it, you receive it. And the way you prove that you believe it is you say what you believe. All right. So let's look at this. Is the next verse. For if they which are of the Lord be heirs, you see that? Faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. So if indeed we are going by the law to receive our inheritance, then we make faith void and the promise, the question is what is the promise? What is this promise that God made to Abraham? Because everything that happened, happened for this promise to be delivered to man. I submit to you that the promise is God's spirit dwelling on the inside of you. God's spirit possessing your spirit. That is the promise God made to Abraham. Nothing, that, of course, there's a promise of the land of Israel, but he told him that if you're going to be a, a blessing to all nations, if you live here in America, what do you want Israel for? The land of Israel for? So there has to be something that is different than the land as a promise. Are you going to be here? That, oh, are you here? Yes. There is a land of promise, I submit to you, yes, that God made to Abraham. But I'm saying the greater promise made was that the spirit of the living God would dwell in man. That's why Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. Unfortunately, our Jewish brothers and sisters are more concerned about the land than they are about what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is what is available to every man, whether you live in Africa, Asia, America, or anywhere else, which is the spirit of the living God coming to dwell on the inside. As a promise God made to Abraham. Oh, glory. All right, next verse. 
Because the law worketh wrath, for there, where no law is, there is no transgression. I don't want to get into all of that today. Verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. He said already that it was not a great, it was not a law, but it was by faith. If it is not by faith, then the promise is made non effect. But if it's of faith, and it's a gift. We know that. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Grace is the gift. Yeah. You get me here? Yeah. All right. To the end, the promise, the promise, there you go, the promise might be sure to all the sea. Did you get it? The promise, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law. My time is up here. But to, to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And I'll pick up from here next week. Pick up from verse 16 next week. Stand up to your feet. Praise the Lord.